Our text this morning is God's Word, or the portion of God's Word that we considered is the entire chapter, Job 28. Let's just read the conclusion of that chapter in verse 28. And unto man he said, Behold the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. We choose this chapter this morning as an encouragement to us to be diligent in our study of God's Word and in the searching of the wisdom that is to be found in Jesus Christ as a congregation, in our Bible studies, and in our own personal lives of devotions, as well as for our children and catechism, and for all of us that we be, as we read, of the church in Berea, that they diligently search the scriptures. I have chosen the title for this chapter to be the quest for wisdom. Children, I take the word quest and not just search. A search, the word search defines an activity. You are looking for something. The word quest emphasizes the intensity and the passion of your search. We have here a quest for wisdom. It tells us, this chapter tells us, of an intense search for wisdom. And it tells us that wisdom is a priceless, <coughs> something priceless and beyond value, and something that man cannot find of himself, in fact, does not want it, and that it is something that God and God alone can give to us and show us where it is to be found. Job chapter 28 is very unique in the book of Job, and I would say that this chapter is, in re is to all intents and purposes an interlude in the discussion of the book of Job. You will remember that the book of Job it consists, for the most part, of the discussion between Job and his friends as to why Job has been so sorely afflicted by God. In this discussion between Job and his three friends, it had come to a point in chapters 26 and 27 that, that it had become very heated. Job has become impassioned. Job has become very vehement in his defense against Bildad and the other three friends, for Bildad and his other friends have insinuated that Job's sufferings have come to him for some way because of an unforsaken sin within the man's life. Chapter 25, verse 4, Bildad says something that is absolutely true of itself. How then can man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? But behind it are all of his arguments that he has been making when he speaks. Behind it he is saying in those words, Job, if you were not living in some heinous sin, God would not have done this to you. In chapter 26, Job responds very emphatically to that. He responds in the beginning of chapter 26 that Bildad's words are of no help to him in his suffering. Verse 2, How hast thou helped him that is without power? How savest thou the arm that hath no strength? How hast thou counseled him that hath no wisdom? How hast thou plentifully declared the thing as it is? You have not declared the thing as it is. And he continues in chapter 26, and then in chapter 27, very strongly, he becomes emphatic. In fact, he becomes a bit too emphatic in his own integrity concerning a matter in his life of a hidden sin. He says in chapter 27, verses 5 and 6, God forbid that I should justify you till I die. I will not remove my integrity from me. My righteousness I hold fast and will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me as long as I live. Job has been vehement 
in his defense of himself that he is not being chastened because of an unrepentant sin. But now, in chapter 28, that heat and vehemence is subsiding, the waves of agitation are calmed and he is led by the Holy Spirit in chapter 28 to speak about true wisdom, about priceless wisdom, about a wisdom that is dependent entirely upon God and comes exclusively from God. In the chapter we are taught by the Holy Spirit that wisdom, wisdom is to reverence God so much that we are afraid to sin. To reverence God, wisdom, to reverence God in your heart to such a degree that you shun evil. And I find that very applicable to us at all times as a congregation, to us as children of God, that we are constantly called to be on a quest to search out the hidden wisdom that God has revealed to us in the Scriptures. What the Bible calls that wisdom that is from above, James chapter 3, the wisdom of God, Ephesians 4, the Christ, the key of all wisdom, Colossians chapter 2. We are called to get this wisdom, to search out the truths of God's Word, to mine down into the Holy Scriptures in order that we might acquire the true wisdom of God. We do that, I believe, here as a congregation. If I have it correct, we do that on Wednesday night when we gather together in your Bible study in the congregation. Perhaps you leave your children at home and they say, well, where are you going? And you will respond and you will say, we are on a quest for something more valuable than life. <coughs> more precious than any stone or gem, the wisdom that is to be found of God in the Scriptures. You do that, children, when, I'm not sure what day you have catechism, but you do that when on that day you have catechism and you go up those stairs and you go into catechism, and if someone outside were to ask you, well, what are you doing? What, why are you here during the weekday? you would respond and you would say, I'm here that I might obtain something that's better than gold and silver. In fact, all the gold and all the silver in the whole world. I am here to learn. I want to learn how to reverence God in my heart so that I am kept from evil, the evil that is threatening to swallow up my whole life. I am here for the pearl of great price. And so, as a congregation, whether that be on the Sabbath day, whether that be in our own devotions, whether that be in those times that we meet together for joint study of the Word of God, we are gathered together in order that we might come to know God. We might come to know God as everything. And being awed and humbled by our God and overwhelmed by our God, the result may be that we become afraid. We become afraid to do the least Conquer to his will. <clears throat> For wisdom. Behold the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. The quest for wisdom. Let's see in this chapter that, first of all, this is elusive to man. But secondly, it is discovered by grace. And finally, that this wisdom. Priceless. In verses 1 through 11, Job, under inspiration, is using the example of mining into the earth for precious metals, for stones, silver, and gold. He is referring to the intense efforts that man will extend to find precious stones and metals under the soil that are not seen, to dig down for those riches. And when you read the chapter, and you remember that Job lived 1900 years before the birth of Jesus Christ, 
then you learn that man has always been on a quest for earthly riches and that man has always demonstrated a desire and a knowledge, a skill to know where these metals are and the effort to get them. The equipment today may have improved, the expertise in geology may have advanced, but man has always sought these things that are below and he has devoted his life and he has put himself at risk and he has diligently found them. And the point of this comparison is that while man can figure out where silver and gold lie hidden beneath the earth, out of sight, veins of silver and veins of gold, and though he learns how to extract copper from the rocks, and though he learns the likelihood of where precious gems will be found within the darkness of a cave, and though he will risk his life to dig down under tons of rock and soil, and he will work hard to bring them up to the surface, surface and though he will endure cave-ins, and he will figure out ways to divert flooded shafts of their water, so that he brings up the gold and the silver, the crystal and the copper, the pearls and the rubies that are hidden beneath, though he can do that, and though he is intent to do that, the place of wisdom, he does not know it. He can't find it. He can't bring it up. He can't put it to use. The wisdom that is of God. He has no interest in his heart, apart from God, for those spiritual wisdoms, for that spiritual wisdom and those spiritual things for the soul, the treasures of God, of salvation, of God's Son, of peace, of righteousness, of the pardon of sins, all those treasures that are to be found in the arms of God's grace and covenant, for these things he will not extend effort to find them. He will not sell off his property to move to find those things. He will not stake his life upon those things and dig down into those things. He has an intelligence. He has a wit to dive into the depths of the earth to find a vanishing treasure. And he will go through great pains to obtain that vanishing treasure of silver and gold, but for the wisdom that is to be found in Jesus Christ. He knows not where that is found. Or does he care to find it? So let's follow in your Bibles with me the first 11 verses, which, as I said, speaks to us of mining. In verse 1, we learn that man possesses the knowledge of geology. He knows where the vein for the silver is to be found, and the place for the gold he can find it. He knows where they lie beneath the earth. He knows where to place his shaft. Verse 2, he is able to locate loads of iron ore and copper and brass. Iron is taken out of the earth. Brass or copper is smelted, literally, out of the stone. So he can find iron in northern Michigan. Copper mine and iron mines that are now ghost towns, but they were able to extract the copper and the iron out of the hills. <coughs> Verse 3, he set them into the darkness and searches out, we could translate, he searches out every recess. We could translate it this way, for ore in the darkness and in the shadow of death. <laughs> he is willing to go into the darkness, into every recess. The horrible fear of being underground and being in total darkness, in the shadow of death. He puts that fear aside and he goes down. Verse 4 tells us that he breaks open a shaft in some remote place in the earth, <coughs> far from the inhabitants. And then he lowers a man down on a rope to swing to and fro. We translate it this way. He breaks open a shaft, verse 4, far from the inhabitant or from where people live. 
even in places forgotten of the foot. They hang down and they swing to and fro from man. In other words, he's talking about lowering someone down into the shaft that is made. The, ver the chapter goes on to speak to us of the fact that as he opens up the earth, there are shafts not of bread, as for the earth out of it cometh bread, but we could translate, out of the earth cometh forth heat. And he understands that there is heat and gases under the earth, and he learns how to control these things. He knew this already in the time of Job. He searches. He finds the path of gold and sapphire, verse 6 tells us. Verse 7 tells us that even though no falcon's eye, not vulture, but falcon, the eagle eye of the falcon, even though the eagle eye of the falcon hath not seen it, he is able to find where these jewels are to be in the earth. Verse 8 tells us of the proud lion with its family, its pride, as they walk as kings of the jungle, we say, kings of the earth, but these lions do not know what is under their feet, but man knows what is under the feet. And then in verses 9 through 11, he refers to the fact that man will dig down to the very roots of the mountains, he says. In the state of Colorado, there are shafts driven 3,000, 4,000 feet down into the earth. He cuts out his channels, verse 10. He cutteth out not rivers, but channels among the rocks. He goes down to find these precious veins of metal. Verse 11, he dams up the streams trickling, which refers to the fact that he's able to, walk, to drain the water of flooded shafts. And his eye, finally we read in verse 11, and the thing that is hid bringeth he forth to light, or we could translate, his eye seeth every precious thing. And there the picture is that finally, way down in the bowels of the earth, he wipes away the soot and the dirt from his face and he pulls out the rock. And it's gold. And he says, it's mine. Verse 12. But where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Man knoweth not the price thereof, neither is it found in the land of the living. Verse 21, <coughs> seeing it is hid from the eyes of all living, and kept close from the fowls of the air. He can't find wisdom, the wisdom of God. He can't find it. He's not interested to find it. He cannot discover it. That is not because God has <coughs> his wisdom from him. That he has given to man no testimony of where this wisdom is to be found. It is revealed. The wisdom of God in Jesus Christ is revealed in the Holy Scriptures. But a man's mind is darkened. Though he is able to show his ingenuity and his drive to find what man considers he cannot find that which is truly valuable, the wisdom of God. I'd like to interject at this point the question to you and to me whether we then search for this wisdom as diligently as man will search for his vanishing gold. Do we labor to have the precious metals, the precious gold of God's word and his promises and truth. Do we risk? Do we give everything that we might find it, even as a miner risks his life for that which perishes? Do we search it out? Do we, to follow the figure of the text, go far from the inhabitants? That is, do we go off on a regular basis? in our lives, with our Bible, 
and in prayer, and do we delve into those scriptures to find the silver and the gold of God's all-sufficient grace, that which will sustain you in your trials and in your needs? Or do we crawl through the dark tunnels of trial and suffering, the darkness sometimes of a trial that we might find at the end the black sapphire of God's abundant grace. Do we sweat? Do we dig? Do we apply? Do we desire to learn that truth of Holy Scripture, the ways of our God? Or do we say, concerning spiritual things, willing to extend our effort, mind, and energy for earthly things, but do we say concerning spiritual things, the great things of the Reformed and Biblical truth, do we say, you mean, you mean i got to work to get this? i got to think? i, I got to pay attention? I have to actually learn this? Why cannot religion be made simple and easy? Do we say, I can get myself regularly exercise my body. I can get myself to cram for the test. I can search out and trace down what they said about me. I'll follow that down every tunnel to find out what they said about me. Do we search for God's wisdom? Do we search it out? Or do we say, it better be simple, and it better be quick, or I'm out. The scriptures are calling us to search for the hidden truths, not conceived, but those truths of God's word. Man can't find them. Man can't find them because his heart is darkened and he is alienated from God. Ephesians chapter 4, having their understanding darkened. Romans chapter 1, professing themselves to be wise, they have become <coughs> fools and they have denied the living and the true God. And now in verse 14 and following, Job, under the inspiration, has places of the earth respond to the question, where is wisdom to be found? And they're going to respond to that question. These places of the earth are going to respond to the question with the answer, it is not with me. Verse 14, the first place is the sea. We read in verse 14, the depth saith, remember the question is, where is wisdom? The depth saith, it is not in me. And the sea saith, it is not with me. The depth, the depth of the sea, 20,000 feet, 27,000 feet under the surface, thousands of pounds of pressure per square inch. Man cannot go down there. If he goes down there in his submarine, it is crushed like tinfoil. And then he makes his bathysphere, his diving sphere, to go down, down, down into the depths of the sea. And he turns on his lights and he's startled. There's something already there. There's fish that can live there. There's fish that glow. There's beautiful fish. There's a whole cycle of life. And he asked, how is that possible down here? He scratches his beard. He gets out of his microscope. But apart from faith, the depth does not speak of his wisdom. For the wisdom of the depths is to be found in God. And in these words, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. They are, and they were, created for His glory, even into the depths of the sea and the glowing fish down there. God made them all. But He can't find Man can't find that wisdom. Verse 22 has another place on earth answering the question. They answer the question a little differently. Death 
Destruction and death say, and the King James has, we have heard the fame thereof with our ears. We could translate that. Destruction and death say, only a rumor of it hath reached our ears. Destruction. When God sends the destruction of war, tornado, hurricane, and God gives sobriety, at least for a while, to man from his drunkenness and his materialism. And this destruction causes man to begin to ask questions, deep questions, in his distress. After the ruin of 9-11, or after another catastrophe, destruction asks, where is wisdom? hears a rumor. To him it's a rumor. He hears a rumor of it, of that man called Jesus who spoke these words. What does it profit you if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? I am the light of the world. But that's a rumor. That's that voice of Christ in the gospel. And death, death hears the rumor of this wisdom. It has reached its ears. Especially it has reached its ears in our Western society. And it has reached its ears in our hospitals. Death. On the deathbed. A man is on his deathbed. And he asks the question, who am I? What is life? Where am I going? What's going to happen to me? The doctor has just pronounced a death sentence. I will not recover. I have but days. And into his hospital room comes the modern pastor, who we would call not pastor, but religious facilitator. And he says, or she says to him, I'm here to help you with this experience. It's understandable how you are feeling. You are, after all, human. Does believing what you believe help you? Well, then that's okay. You believe that. Be assured there is no help. Just die meaningfully. Sleep on now. Take the sleep of death. And death, that is the man at the point of death, shakes himself, and he cries out, Get him out of here! And bring me someone who can tell me wisdom! For I heard the rumor of it. I heard the rumor of it when I was but a boy. I heard the rumor in that church of Christ and the atonement and of faith and of God and of sin and of a cross. But he knows only the rumor of it. Of the vague indescribable, elusive words. But vague notions do not save anyone. Where shall wisdom be found? A wisdom that is strong and sure. The opening of the eye unto the truth of God. The knowledge of faith that brings peace in Jesus Christ. The answer to all of life. The answer to why I am created and what purpose I serve. Where cometh wisdom? Where is the place of understanding? Asked Job. And he responds, verse 20, It is not found in the land of the living. Man can't find it. It is hid from the eyes of all living. It is conceived from the following. For it is to be found only <coughs> in God. Verse 23. God understands the way thereof, that is the way of wisdom, and he knoweth the place. God knows the place where wisdom is to be found. He prepared it, says the text. Yea, he searched it out. Verse 27. Wisdom is to be 
found in God. The God of truth, who has revealed his truth and his wisdom in the Holy Scriptures. Wisdom is to be found through grace, to be brought face to face with the living and the true God. The God who, Job says, knows the way of wisdom. That is, the God who is able to part the depth of darkness in our hearts and to plant within our hearts the sapphire of regeneration, the pearl of great price, of Christ and Him crucified, and faith in Jesus Christ. Wisdom is to be found in God, and wisdom is when God opens your heart by His wonderful love and grace, that you love Him and come to know Him and bow before His truth. Wisdom is found in complete submission of faith and in loving subjection to the Word of God. <coughs> this is wisdom. Our Western world has rejected God in their vaunted wisdom. They have rejected His commands and the gospel of His Son, Jesus Christ, as the only way of life. They have said that they find the thou shalt not of God's law to be repulsive and ridiculous. They will say that belief in God at some level for every person has its importance, just like being a vegetarian has its importance, or the green earth has its importance. Being a spiritual person has some importance. But man does not want anything that would hint of a responsibility of his soul to his maker, or of his guilt, or of his sin. Man's wisdom in this world is ever-changing, but it is especially as a plate that experience enriches life. You can navigate your life by your experiences. Try it out. See if it fits for you. Try out sexual intercourse. Practice safe sex. But don't worry about breaking God's marriage covenant. Try it out and see what you think. Try to discover your sexual orientation. Experiment. It will improve you. God says that trying out sin for size will not improve people, but it will ruin them. That's what God says. And he leaves testimony of it. And his righteousness in HIV and his spread. But man is wiser than that. The church comes into the church, the emergence of church. They respond with the word adaptation. No problem. Biblical doctrine and biblical commands are no longer really important. In effect, the emergent church is paganism brought into the church. Hell does not exist. We really don't believe that. The merchant church appeals to the world and is conforming. It's not that the child of God is to be conformed out of the world to Christ, but the church now must conform herself to the world so that the world might become more of the church. And beloved, how, with our sinful nature, as we go through this world, how do, how do we fare? How are we any different of ourselves? Who then, by who then, will stand steadfast in this day? <clears throat> Only he and she who by God's grace is prepared to sacrifice everything 
to their faith. Only they who seeks their life in nothing other than to obey the commandments of their Savior, Jesus Christ, and to follow the call of God. The only way is commitment, gracious commitment to the Word of God. Otherwise, we will perish. Wisdom is of God. Wisdom is of God because <coughs> He is God. He is perfect and glorious, eternal, right, and true in Himself. He is the one true and living God, filled with all of His virtues, holy, gracious, and eternally committed to his own glory. Knowing God is wisdom. In verse 24, Job puts it this way. He speaks of God's majesty. For he looketh, that is, God looketh to the ends of the earth, and he seeth unto the whole of heaven. Verse 25, to make weight for the winds, and he weighed the waters by measure. When he made a decree for the rain, and away to the light of the thunder. He's referring there to the fact that God is the one who makes the barometric pressure, the weight of the wind, the weight of the water, water pressure. God does that. The path of the lightning bolt or of the thunder. These all are expressions in the creation of God. Expressions that we normally do not give any thought to, but God does. All of these things are His hand, His wisdom, His power, and all of them declare that He is God. <coughs> and wisdom then, says God, verse 28, and unto man, so He declares Himself in the creation in all of His glory and wisdom. And then by grace, He speaks <coughs> unto man, that is, by grace He speaks unto us, and He says, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, verse 28, and to depart from evil is understanding. And so he boils it all down to us. What is wisdom? Wisdom is to reverence God, the fear of God. It is to reverence Him in your heart and to reverence Him to such a degree that you're afraid of sin. And you shun sin. To fear God is to stand in awe of Him, not because we have made Him to be something that He's not, but because grace has taught us something of who He is. Grace which has given us through the Scriptures true thoughts of God. And every true thought of God is a great thought of God. The fear of God is to tremble, to so reverence Him in our hearts as the God of, His, of grace in Christ and in all of His glory and power and holiness. At the thought of this, we tremble at the thought of denying Him with distrust or disobedience. It is the feeling that God is not to be trifled with. It is to shudder to fear God, to reverence Him, is to experience a shudder at the thought of seeing Him dishonored in what I say or what I do. If we can think of God and yawn, we do not know Him. To fear God is to reverence Him from the heart as the glorious God of my salvation. And this is purifying. This shall purify. When God is so much God to us that we shun evil. Only this 
his wisdom. He is to be found by grace for sinners, foolish sinners, in Jesus Christ. He is to be found in that grace of the cross of Jesus Christ which changes our hearts so that the love, the allegiance of the heart is changed from sin. And there is now a new allegiance to God and to His Son, Jesus Christ. And then this grows, this wisdom grows and advances. But you must be on a quest for it. It creates within us a passionate desire to have it. And so we search. We search for the veins of gold called his promises. We mine up the sapphires of his redeeming grace. And then we melt down the iron of faith through prayer. And we form it in our lives. This wisdom, beloved, is priceless. So he speaks of that again at verse 15. He says it cannot be purchased for gold. You can't pay for this wisdom. Neither shall silver be weighed for the price thereof. There's no scale that if you get enough silver, finally you have enough to give you the balance for wisdom. He goes on in verses 16 through 19 to say that the value of wisdom exceeds the value of everything that a man would ever come to to be valuable. The gold of Ophir, that is of Saudi Arabia. The precious onyx, that is that white sapphire. The crystal, the jewels he speaks of. Coral, pearls, rubies, the topaz of Ethiopia. We could add, add the crown jewels of England. God's wisdom is of more value than all these things which will perish, which have no value. They have no value. For God puts no value on them. Wisdom teaches me to value what God values. Hope and peace. A contrite heart. A repentant spirit. A heart that is earnest after the eternal treasures of Christ and His righteousness, the desire that the Holy Spirit sanctify me within my heart. This is the priceless wisdom given by grace. Let us pursue it. Let us be on a quest for this wisdom. If it were discovered this morning, that in reality you have built your new church building on property and it can be confirmed that 400 feet straight down is a vein of gold studded with diamonds. The value of this property skyrockets. Everybody stakes out their claim in the parking lot he gets their pickaxe and begins to dig. Another buys a backhoe to dig up to get down. We hear the engines of the generators running so that we can have light at night. We extend every effort to get down 400 feet to where we are promised gold and diamonds. We even lower down on a rope a little child to see if we're deep enough. We're hit with gold fever. For what? For what? For that which will perish in the day of days. But now let me tell you something that is absolutely true. There is a vein of gold here. There are jewels and silver and pearls and every pleasant thing to be found right here by God's grace in His church. Dig into that. Delve into that. Treasure it beyond all compare. Study the Scriptures. And 
define what you were created for to glorify God through Jesus Christ, His Son. That's wisdom. Amen.